Okay, I think it's time now. Uh, so again, welcome back everybody. Uh, this is session four of uh, webinar series on introduction to satellite remote sensing for air quality applications. And today we are going to talk about the Tresgas products uh, uh, and their application for health and air quality. So just to give you a quick uh, overview of the agenda, we have covered week one, fundamental of remote sensing. Uh, week two, we did some satellite imageries and how to use and how to get the data. Uh, last week, we have done uh, uh, learn about the aerosols data, which can be used to get the particular meter or PM2.5 air quality application. And today, uh, we are going to talk about the trace gas data. So today, uh, we have uh, Dr. Brian Duncan. Uh, he is a scientist here at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in atmospheric and uh, atmospheric chemistry and dynamics branch. He is also member of uh, NASA's applied health and air quality applied science team. Uh, he has long experience and he has done a lot of work on trace gases and uh, uh, other uh, other air quality rate applications. So with that, I will now hand over to Dr. Brian, who will start his presentation. Thank you, Dr. Brian. Hi, welcome everybody. Um, when most people think of NASA, you know, they think of uh, the moon landing, the Mars rover, the Juno probe, but uh, NASA does more than that. It has a fleet of satellites that orbit the Earth, and you know that because you're on this RSET training and you've already taken a few courses. So I'll talk about some of the satellites that we use for health and air quality applications. And I always like to show this beautiful image simply because it's beautiful. Okay, so I, I will start with a few high-level comments uh, about how the satellite data can be used, and I will focus on some of my own research since I know that the best. Uh, before I go on, I would like to tell you uh, that I am not uh, an instrument engineer. I don't work on the satellites. Also, I do not work on processing the electromagnetic radiation that the satellite instruments measure into quantities like um, uh, PPB, for instance. I, I don't do any of that. I'm an end user of the data, probably like most of you. So I will be discussing this more from the perspective of the end user, applications of the data. There are a number of resources out there, such as the RSET program, but I wanted to point you to a few uh, articles and other resources that you may not know. This one is a review article that was written by uh, members of what's called the Air Quality Applied Sciences Team. I'll talk about that in a minute, and members of the RSET program. These are two complementary programs at NASA. We work together. Uh, and you can see that Anna Prados and Paulo Gupta from our set are both uh, co-authors on this, this article. Uh, but this is a free article. The link is at the bottom. And I recommend if, you, if you're new to satellite data, or even if you haven't worked with it that much, please take a look at this article because it gives a lot of the basics. Uh, also in this article in table two, there are a number of web tools listed that are free for everybody. You can go to any of them, make plots of the data, or download the data yourself. Here is another article if you're interested in using satellite data to estimate emissions, such as from power plants or from cities. Uh, David Streets, he was also a member of ACAST, uh, wrote this article. And he gives an overview of what we can and what we can't do currently, and what are the possibilities for the future. Unfortunately, this article is not free to download. I have the link here so you can look at the abstract, and hopefully you can uh, get the article at some point. Okay. 
Earlier, I mentioned the NASA Air Quality Applied Sciences team. The job of ACAST is to facilitate the use of satellite data by the air quality community. ACAST uh, just ended in May, and it's being replaced by the Health and Air Quality Applied Sciences team, or HACAST. And we will probably meet in November for the first time. But we have the same goals to facilitate the use of satellite data by the air quality and the health communities. So you may want to check out this website, acast.org, to see if there's any resources there for you. And the HACAST is there for you. Anybody can uh, request help with analyses or just to ask for advice. Here is a graphic of the current and planned NASA mission. I have indicated with a red arrow all of the missions that have at least some instrument that measures uh, a trace gas or aerosol that are relevant for health and air quality applications. There are two upcoming satellite missions. They're being built now. Tempo and Pace, they're the ones in yellow at the top. Uh, and there are some older missions, uh, such as Terra, Aqua, and Aura. Uh, Aura just had its 12th anniversary since launch, and it's one of the younger instruments. Terra is uh, almost 18 years old at this point. We also have OCO2, which measures CO2, carbon dioxide, and SUMI MPP which gives us some information on compounds like sulfur dioxide. Calypso is another instrument that measures aerosols. I put stars by the Aura satellite since I'm the deputy project scientist for the Aura satellite, but also because it has one of its objectives uh, to measure atmospheric composition and air quality, uh, various pollutants, and I'll talk about those next. Okay, so what is the primary advantage of satellite data? Well, it's spatial coverage. Uh, when you look at surface data, such as from an air quality network, like in the US or Europe or elsewhere, uh, they're just very, uh, they're very sparse and they're only in a few locations. So they don't give you the big picture. So satellites provide a God's eye view of air pollution. This is not, a satellite image. This is actually a photograph taken by an astronaut on NASA Skylab in 1973. And the circle indicates the city of Los Angeles. And you can see clearly the pollution, the thick layer of pollution that plagued the city at that time. Uh, since then, air quality has improved quite dramatically in the US. And I'll show some, some of those uh, satellite data that indicate this in a minute. So when it comes to spatial coverage, uh, certain satellites and instruments have different levels of coverage. Sometimes they cover every, every location on the Earth's surface once a day or three times a day or even less. Some of this depends on the way the instrument is designed, but also the altitude of the instrument. Uh, the farther the instrument is from the Earth's surface, uh, the better chance it has to see the entire Earth within one day to provide global coverage in, in one day. So what this shows are three different data sets from three different instruments collected on one day. And then the top, uh, this is of, the t of, of ozone in the Earth's atmosphere. And it's primarily showing you the stratospheric ozone. But you can clearly see that the coverage in the top panel is greater than in the lower two panels. The white areas indicate no data for that day. This is an image of one air pollutant, nitrogen dioxide. And essentially, it comes out of tailpipes and smokestacks. So whenever you burn coal and gasoline, you produce nitrogen dioxide. 
Nitrogen dioxide is unhealthy to breathe. We don't want to breathe it, but the levels in most countries are pretty low, below the health requirement. Uh, however, nitrogen dioxide has been shown to be correlated with morbidity and mortality. And that's likely because it's co-emitted with other nasty air pollutants, they are toxic, and it's a necessary ingredient for ozone formation. And this image shows the highest concentrations of nitrogen dioxide are in U.S. cities, particularly where the population density is the highest, such as the Northeast U.S. If you want to read about air quality from the nitrogen dioxide perspective around the world and how it's changed over the last 10 years, you can take a look at an article that I just published in uh, January. It's in the, low, the reference of the, the lower left-hand corner of the screen. And you can take a look and see how air quality is changing in, in your area of the world. So satellite data give you a God's eye view of the world, but the data products now are, are becoming so good that we can actually get down to gradients within an urban area. This example is of Atlanta in the United States, the southeastern United States. And the data uh, here have been gridded to a 10 by 10 kilometer squared grid, and that's very high resolution for this type of data. And the reason why we can do this now is because the process by which uh, one converts electromagnetic radiation, which is detected by a satellite instrument, into a, 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 a trace gas like nitrogen dioxide, that uh, process called a retrieval has become so refined, so much improved over the last few decades, um, that now we're able to look at these suburban spatial gradients. Over the last 20, 30 years in the United States, air pollution has improved quite a bit. So, and especially in the last 10 years. So here we are seeing the uh, change in nitrogen dioxide pollution from 2005 to 2014, just a few years ago. And you can see that the nitrogen dioxide levels have decreased uh, by as much as 50%. This is a large decrease. And this is because of environmental regulations to reduce emissions on power plants and automobiles and other sources of like factories. And if you look at the inset of Atlanta, you can see that we that the satellite can detect suburban spatial gradients in these changes uh, on very short time scales within the city limits. Uh, you can see the largest changes occurred on the southwestern side of Atlanta, and that is where much of the industry and their major airport is. Here is the view, the same image, uh, but zoomed out to the whole U.S. And over the whole U.S., there were decreases of 20 to 50 percent over the last decade. And these images, there are many more for the U.S. And, and the world. And they're publicly available, they're free. You can go to this website, they are, that's in the upper right corner, and download them yourself if you wish. Uh, but what I think this graphic really shows is the Clean Air Act is really working. There were only a few places in the United States where air quality became worse over the last decade. And these areas are associated with oil and natural gas activities. Uh, you probably have heard of fracking. And there are three primary areas in the US that I'm showing here where this activity increased quite dramatically in the last 10 years. Uh, in North Dakota, in the upper left-hand corner, you can see, as indicated by the red areas, that nitrogen dioxide pollution increased by up to 40%. The decreasing area there in the center of North Dakota 
is the city of Bismarck. If you go down to Texas in the lower left hand corner, you can see other areas of increase in red. And these are also associated with two areas um, of intense oil and natural gas extraction in the Permian Basin and Eagle Ford. If you look on the right hand side, you can clearly see these areas in the lights at night data. So these lights at night data show that uh, indicate where there are street lights and other lights associated with this oil and natural gas extraction, but also flaring of unwanted methane gas. Uh, so it's, it's this light to night data are co-located with the changes in Omina too. So that's an excellent indicator that this associated with the oil and natural gas industry. Okay, so a satellite instrument doesn't measure a quantity like um, a mixing ratio, like a PPB. Instead, it measures electromagnetic radiation. And as I mentioned, there's this complicated process called a retrieval algorithm that is used to take this electromagnetic radiation and convert it to a quantity that we're familiar with, such as PPB, like a concentration or an emission rate. So in so a number of people are working very hard on this to do this conversion. And many of the instruments that I'll discuss actually measure what's called a column. And that's the total number of molecules of a gas, like nitrogen dioxide, between the satellite and the Earth's surface. And the units are usually in molecules per centimeter squared. Uh, this quantity really doesn't mean much to the health and air quality communities because they don't know what the nose level concentration is, for instance, or the emissions are uh, from these data. And they're most interested in these quantities. So we have to use global models to interpret where the air pollutant is in the atmosphere. Is it above nose level? Is it at nose level, for instance? So there's a lot of work going on in this area. So here are a few satellite, uh, a few air pollutants measured by satellites and the units that are reported. I just showed you a column, molecules per centimeter squared. Some of the species are reported in Dobson units, which is really just a column uh, multiplied by a factor, 2.69 times 10 to the 16th. And some of the gases are reported as volume mixing ratios like PPB or PPM. Now in the US, uh, there are six common pollutants, carbon monoxide, lead, nitrogen dioxide, particulate matter, ozone and sulfur dioxide. And we have information on five of these gases from space. Uh, we can't measure lead as far as I'm aware, but you can see that the units that they measure from the ground that, uh, for instance, the Environmental Protection Agency or some environmental agency would be interested in, we don't have those units just yet. So a lot of people are still working on this in the remote sensing community. Uh, and it comes down to how do we translate these column measurements to ground level values. So there's a lot of smart people working on this. I've done some work with quite a few people in ACAS uh, to do just this. So we wanted to know how nitrogen dioxide measured from a satellite instrument compared to uh, EPA air quality system surface monitor data. And we also looked at how it compared to emissions data reported from individual power plants. And these two papers are uh, free for download uh, in a journal called Atmospheric Environment. This image shows uh, in the top panel how the surface monitor, AQS, compares to the data from one instrument only, the ozone monitoring instrument. 
over about an eight year period. And you can see that the, uh, that the changes over time, the increases and decreases, agree pretty well. And that's indicating that nitrogen dioxide from space does reflect what's going on at the surface. And this is because nitrogen dioxide is primarily emitted at the surface, and it also has a short lifetime. So it doesn't have a chance to mix in the atmosphere. When we normalize the data and create an anomaly, you can see the anomaly is quite correlated for both data sets. And then the same is true for the change over time as an annual average. If you want to look at how nitrogen dioxide has changed over time for 195 cities around the world, go to this website, airquality.gfsc.nasa.gov, and you can look at how it's changed for your, your location. There's also other information on there, such as news and uh, relevant publications and other data resources for the end user. We only have nitrogen dioxide data on there now, but we plan to add others like particulate matter, sulfur dioxide, ammonia, carbon monoxide. So you may want to visit the site uh, frequently to see how we're updating things. Okay, so I've only talked about nitrogen dioxide data. There's more uh, than just nitrogen dioxide, there's other air pollutants like sulfur dioxide, ozone, particulate matter, and so on. So let me talk a little bit about those next. Now to measure air pollutants, we primarily rely on what, are, what is called passive remote sensing. So the instruments in space uh, very passively observe or, or uh, detect electromagnetic radiation coming from the Earth. So for an instrument like the ozone monitoring instrument, it uses UV and visible wavelengths of light. And these are backscattered from the Earth's atmosphere, from the clouds, from the Earth's surface. Uh, and we can measure several species like nitrogen dioxide, formaldehyde, ozone, and sulfur dioxide. There's another one that uses what's called uh, limb emission or limb viewing, and these use infrared or microwave wavelengths of light. And these are, uh, there are a number of instruments such as TESS, AIRS, and Moppet. And these give us uh, information on gases like uh, methane, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide. First, let me talk about two instruments on the Aura satellite. The first is the ozone monitoring instrument, and the second is the tropospheric emission spectrometer. And if you need or want details, I can give you those details. OMI is an ultraviolet visible down-looking image spectrograph, and it measures solar radiation absorbed and scattered by the Earth's atmosphere. And TESS, the tropospheric emission spectrometer, is an infrared high resolution Fourier transform spectrometer. And it has a, uh, it looks in the limb. That means it looks at the instrument, at the atmosphere from the side. Okay, so of these instruments, I've listed here some of the, well, the, the satellite that they uh, ride on and what these instruments measured and, and what uh, units they measured them in. Uh, I won't read through all of these, but I do want to point out that the ozone monitoring instrument, as the name implies, measures ozone, but it measures a column of ozone. And the problem with that for air quality applications is that a lot of ozone is actually in the stratosphere. So you, it's very difficult to subtract off what's in the stratosphere and also what's in the troposphere because ozone in the troposphere, the region of the atmosphere where we live, where clouds and weather happen, 
is actually uh, well mixed. There's a lot of ozone. So it's really hard to know what's right at nose level, what we're breathing in. So this instrument, the data from this instrument for ozone, isn't particularly useful. And there are a lot of smart people working on this problem, but there are some fundamental issues associated with physics that uh, really need to be overcome. This is a tough problem. Okay, here are some details of the ozone monitoring instrument. Uh, one thing I would like to point out is that the instrument is like a digital camera. It has a lot of pixels, and the pixels that look straight down at the Earth's surface have a spatial footprint of 13 by 24 kilometers squared. That's what's called a meter, looking straight down. However, on the edges, uh, the pixels can become quite large. So 13 by 128 kilometers squared is an example here. So you need to be very careful when you interpret the data or you analyze the data. You have to understand the spatial resolution and how it changes over time in the overpass information. One of the gases only measures the ozone monitoring instrument is sulfur dioxide. And what this shows is how sulfur dioxide has changed over the central U.S. over the last uh, five years. So over 2005 to 2010. And each of these dots represents the location of a power plant. Whenever you burn coal, uh, you're very likely to produce sulfur dioxide because of sulfur impurities inside the coal. So coal is primarily a carbon, but it also has other trace uh, elements in there, such as sulfur. And you can see that quite dramatically, uh, some of these, some of the sulfur dioxide has decreased by up to 90% uh, around some of these power plants. And that's again because of the requirements of the Clean Air Act to scrub the sulfur dioxide emissions from power plants before it's released to the atmosphere. Volcanic uh, sulfur dioxide can also be measured by OMI, and it can be used to help track where the volcanic plumes are moving in the atmosphere so that aircraft can avoid them. Uh, if aircraft uh, draw in volcanic ash, for instance, into their uh, engines, it can actually uh, destroy the engine and call the, cause the plane to crash. So sulfur dioxide is also uh, seen around volcanoes and in volcanic plumes. Just to put air quality in the U.S. into perspective, I'm showing the same region, the Ohio River Valley, uh, that I showed in the previous image. Uh, which, is out, which is shown here in this uh, orangish color. And on the same scale, you see China. And the hottest hot spot in China is associated with their power plants, where there's a large cluster of power plants. So sulfur dioxide emissions in China are much higher than in the US. However, in the last few years, China has begun to implement emission controls as well. So their pollutant levels have been decreasing over the last five years. Okay, I told you that we can't measure ozone, uh, nose level ozone just yet. But we do have information on ozone precursors, the necessary ingredients to produce high levels of ozone in polluted areas. And ozone formation is associated with sunlight, uh, nitrogen oxide, and vol volatile organic compounds or VOCs. Uh, nitrogen oxide, as I mentioned, comes uh, from burning, such as gasoline and cars and power plants, coal and power plants. And the volatile organic compounds, uh, they come from a, a number of sources, uh, petroleum products, paints, other solvents, it's, uh, there's just a lot. And if a car doesn't run efficiently, the problem is, is that it can, instead of producing just carbon dioxide, it can produce other gases, as, uh, other volatile organics as well. So the uh, volatile organics in the gasoline actually aren't always combusted, and so they come out of the tailpipes of cars. And together in the atmosphere, these react to form ozone. Uh, 
we can measure nitrogen dioxide, as I showed, and that's a pretty good proxy for uh, nitrogen oxide. And for volatile organic compounds, it, fortunately, we can measure formaldehyde. And formaldehyde is usually produced when any volatile organic compound, such as uh, ethane, propane, butene, all of these things you find in gasoline, for instance, when they react in the atmosphere and broken down, they usually produce formaldehyde at some point. So this gives you an idea of what's called uh, the VOC reactivity of the atmosphere. This is an important quantity to know how much ozone you're likely to produce. So we have information on, on the ingredients of ozone from space, but we don't really have the information of nose level ozone just yet. Formaldehyde also comes from natural sources in forested areas, comes from trees. And these trees emit it uh, uh, as a function of temperature. So on a cool summer day, the levels are much lower than a warm summer day and even lower than a hot summer day. Why do trees put out these emissions of volatile organic compounds? Uh, I don't think people really understand it quite just yet, uh, but it is a function of temperature. The hotter it is, the more of these VOCs are produced. And the primary VOC is called isoprene. It has five carbons in it. And when it oxidizes or reacts in the atmosphere, it breaks down and forms formaldehyde. So in a place like Atlanta or other places in the southeast U.S. with a lot of trees, um, anthropogenic sources of VOCs are pretty small in relation, in relative to the volatile organic compounds coming from trees naturally. So in these areas and much of the eastern U.S., um, it's not effective to reduce anthropogenic sources of VOCs like in gasoline uh, to reduce ozone you have to reduce nitrogen oxide uh, coming from cars. And that way you can reduce ozone. And that's what the US and Europe have done over the last several decades. And because of that, ozone levels have improved. So there is a, a, a phrase called ozone formation sensitivity that many air quality people use. And many decades ago, people found that you can use the VOCs to NOx ratio to understand how ozone formation is occurring, what it's most sensitive to. Is it most sensitive to reductions in VOCs or nitrogen oxides? So this is a very important quantity. Unfortunately, from space, we can use the formaldehyde to NO2 ratio that we measure on ONI and uh, a few other satellites uh, to indicate where ozone is most sensitive to reductions in nitrogen oxide and where it's most sensitive to reductions in volatile organic compounds of VOC. I've circled uh, several cities in the U.S. and you can see in 2005 that the, the, the colors are purples and blues. This indicates that those cities are very VOC limited. So the only way to, the most effective way to reduce ozone in these cities is to reduce volatile organic compounds coming from cars or paints or solvents or factories. Over the last uh, decade, nitrogen dioxide have been targeted and reduced over most of the U.S. And because of that, the levels, the ozone formation sensitivity has become more what's called NOx limited. You can see that because there are fewer purples in 2013, purples and blues in these cities than there were in 2005. In what's called a transitional regime, um, ozone in a city is equally uh, sensitive to both reductions in VOCs and nitrogen oxides. So this information gives you, um, this satellite data gives you information on what's the most effective way to reduce air pollution in your city. I have a paper on this that's free to download, as you can see in the lower right hand side. Uh, I'm not going to ignore the big red 
spot in the middle of the, the United States, this is associated with isoprene coming from trees again, from natural BFC. And remember I said that it was temperature dependent. So the formaldehyde we're seeing is from isoprene emission. So the, what you see very simply is that 2005 was a much hotter summer than 2013. And that's why there's this red spot in the middle of the country. The uh, formaldehyde levels were very high relative to the NOC level. Another data set that just became available recently uh, that's of interest to the air quality and health communities is ammonia. Ammonia is an air toxic and it also leads to the formation of particulate matter, which is unhealthy to breathe. So the air quality agencies around the world are interested in this species. And it's primarily produced uh, through agriculture. So you see high levels in places like India and the central US, and California. Uh, but it's also produced through wildfires and, and intentional burning, such as you see in South America. So you may want to check out this new paper on this topic uh, that's free for you to download uh, in Atmospheric Chemistry and Physics. It's a journal that's online. Here is another, if you're interested in CO2, carbon dioxide, there's another data set that's currently being developed from the OCO2 instrument. Uh, and you can see the coverage here around the world. So uh, stay tuned, this data, as I said, is under development. It's a relatively, relatively new data set, uh, but it may be of interest to the air quality community. Another instrument is called TESS, the Tropospheric Emission Spectrometer. I talked about that uh, a minute ago. It's on the Aura satellite. And it measures the number of interesting gases, like foreign gas and methanol, carbon monoxide, and ozone. And it also gives you information on the vertical distribution of these species. Here is an example of Mexico City during an overpass in January of 2013. And you can see on the right side uh, the levels of carbon monoxide, methanol, formic acid, and PAN. Um, so all of these different gases give you uh, very simple, uh, give you different information on the sources of air pollution in these megacities. Here are two other cities, well, there's Mexico City plus uh, Lagos, Nigeria on the right. And you can see using this data set how uh, various air pollutants are changing over time. So this is a very powerful data set and a paper is being prepared on this topic very soon uh, and the data uh, are available on the, on the test website. So you may want to visit there to find out more about that. Okay. So there are other data sets out there that aren't just from the U.S. We have data from the European Space Agency and the uh, Japan Space Agency, JAXA. And other countries like India and China are starting to launch satellites as well. So we select data from those countries uh, soon. So here are just a few different satellites and how they're relative to other instruments like GOM2 is a very similar instrument to OMI, and IAZI is a very similar instrument to TESS. And I understand next week, your, uh, or the next uh, webinar, we'll talk about some of these efforts, these global efforts, upcoming instruments. The image that's here shows uh, GOSAT mapping. So this is from the GOSAT instrument, which is maintained by the uh, Japan Space Agency. And so this is a relatively new data set uh, that you may, be a, may have interest in. Let me just show a few uh, different instruments that are upcoming. There's one by the European Space Agency, ESA, and it's called Tropomi. And people refer to Tropomi as super omi So it's the Next instrument coming from OMI, it's called TROPOMI. And it's better in many ways. It has better spatial resolution and better what's called spectral resolution. 
So it's able to see more wavelengths of light in a finer detail. It's to be launched at the end of this year. But what I would like to show is that the previous instruments like Drone 2 and Skiamaki had very large spatial footprints. And only has the currently has the smallest spatial footprint of any instrument that measures nitrogen dioxide. Um, the trophomy is going to get have an even smaller footprint, seven by seven kilometers squared. And since this is uh, an instrument that has been uh, predominantly developed in the Netherlands, the image here is of the Netherlands, so one city wider than. And this image shows how nitrogen dioxide will look uh, from trope only as compared to only. And you can see that it will get a lot more detail, which will allow us to better understand how nitrogen dioxide is changing uh, at the surface and coming from different sources. We'll be able to differentiate sources that are nearby better now. NASA is building what's called the Tempo satellite, and it's also an instrument like OMI, uh, but it will also measure carbon monoxide and methane. And what's new about this instrument is it doesn't orbit the Earth uh, like the other instruments that move from pole to pole that continually orbit the Earth. This one is in what's called geosynchronous orbit. In other words, if you're standing in the United States and looking up and you can see the satellite, it looks like it's staying in the same position, it's not moving. So its orbit is matching the orbit of the Earth. So this gives us information on air pollutants and how they evolve throughout the entire daylight hours. So from morning all the way until the sun sets. This is a, will be a new capability that will be very exciting. It will open up new science for us. And because of the long observing time of this instrument, it's looking at one area, uh, the signal to noise will be better. So that means the uncertainty associated with the data, the noise will be much improved. And we'll have a very small uh, grid box or pixel. So we'll be able to get down to a suburban, suburban scale. And you can see an example of Washington, D.C. here. Okay, so I want to end with a few basic fundamentals about satellite data and how it's collected, just to give you an idea. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, in the review articles that I uh, told you about in the beginning, uh, there are more details given in there. And so I really encourage you to take a look at that, those articles um, and take the time to really understand uh, what, what the data are and how they're collected. Okay, another resource for you is called the Tour of the Elect Electromagnetic Spectrum. And it's produced by NASA. It's a very easy to understand book. It's made for high school students. And you can download the PDF file or use the online version. The web link is there. And there's also this wonderful video uh, that you can check out as well. The link is given there. And this just gives you the basic fundamentals of electromagnetic radiation and how we use different wavelengths of light to uh, observe various aspects of the Earth's atmosphere, including air pollutants. This, by the way, this is free again. As I mentioned, satellites measure electromagnetic radiation. They don't measure concentrations of nitrogen dioxide. So they observe wavelengths of light. And so if you look at the top of the Earth's atmosphere, as this graph shows, you can see the wavelengths of light coming from the sun. And that's, that's called the spectral irradiance. And if you look at the bottom here, uh, or the red areas below the yellow areas, that's what the sunlight is at the Earth's surface, so at sea level. And so that's saying that the atmosphere reflects some sunlight, the clouds reflect it, and also uh, aerosols as well. And, they, and some of these gases in the atmosphere, like greenhouse gases, actually absorb radiation coming from the sun.
And each of these gases in the Earth in the Earth's atmosphere, they absorb different wavelengths of light. So this is called a spectral signature. Uh, each one is relatively unique to each of these gases, and there's some gases listed here. So this is sort of like uh, a human fingerprint that's unique to every human. The problem is, is that there's so many different gases in the Earth's atmosphere that these spectral signatures overlap and they're hard to disentangle, to understand and separate. Think of it like if you were uh, dusting for a fingerprint on a window, for instance, and a hundred other people touch that fingerprint with their own fingerprint then you have to have some way to separate out all the fingerprints and to figure out uh, who the fingerprints belong to, the individuals. Fortunately, some of the gases have, uh, have absorption features and what are called uh, atmospheric windows. So what this means is they have a very clear signal that's not uh, being overlapped with another gas. Uh, for instance, ozone has a certain uh, peak. Nitrogen dioxide is a very easy one to measure. It has a very clear spectral signature. Um, other gases like sulfur dioxide are much harder because you have to, for instance, uh, remove the signal of other gases like ozone. Uh, formaldehyde is even harder because there's several overlapping spectral signatures. And one of the biggest absorbing gases in the atmosphere is water vapor and another is ozone. So it makes it very difficult to sometimes subtract out or to, under, to be able to get at these individual spectral signatures in the data. Okay, to summarize what I just said, uh, satellites detect backscattered solar radiation or emitted thermal radiation. Uh, each gas has its own distinct spectral signature absorption spectra. And by knowing this and using what's called a radiative transfer model, uh, which is basically how radiation from the, from the sun interacts with the Earth's atmosphere, we are able to separate out uh, these spectral signatures so that we can actually estimate, uh, for instance, the nose level concentration of a gas like nitrogen dioxide. Uh, this is a complicated process. It's not without problems. And over time, uh, people are improving these, uh, these methods, and the data sets are becoming uh, much better for air quality applications, even in the last few years. As with any satellite data or with any data, you have to be very aware of the strengths and limitations of the satellite data. Uh, you have to properly account for clouds, for aerosols in the atmosphere. And this becomes an issue for places that have high aerosol loadings, whether it's dust or um, uh, smoke aerosols from like wildfires. Uh, so aerosols interfere. Um, and there's also different sensitivities within the Earth's atmosphere. Some instruments are able to, uh, to detect certain gases at different different layers in the atmosphere, like the upper troposphere or closer to the surface. And whenever you interpret satellite data of a trace gas, you have to be very aware that this gas is just a concentration. Uh, it's not an emission rate. So you have to take into account how this gas has been transported by weather in the atmosphere. Uh, chemistry, uh, a lot of these gases are removed at different rates. Uh, depending where they are in the atmosphere, what time of year it is, and you have to be careful about where they are emitted. Uh, some gases are emitted in rather large pulses, like in wildfire. So if you're going to use the satellite data properly, you need to understand what type of data you're using, whether it's a column or a layer product, which means a vertical layer in the atmosphere, uh, where the column is most sensitive. So if you have an atmospheric column like for ozone, it's more sensitive to ozone layer, or ozone molecules higher up in the atmosphere, and not so sensitive to the ones right near the surface. So that's why this ozone column is not particularly useful for air quality applications. It's not going to be in those level values. Uh, there are other considerations here, such as the 
uh, spatio-temporal uh, resolution and the pixel resolution of an instrument, uh, what is coverage, being, what, uh, the spatial coverage, uh, and uh, how often the data are collected. Uh, the overpass time is important too. Many of the satellites overpass at only one time of day. And that's the advantage of a geosynchronous uh, satellite like Tempo, is it gives you coverage uh, throughout the entire day. So just a few final remarks for you to take home. Okay, over the years, satellite data has been shown to be very powerful for the health and air quality uh, applications. And many from these communities are using the data now. Uh, but it's very important to understand the strengths and limitations of the data for a particular application. Uh, I've seen a number of really smart people uh, make really bad and wrong conclusions with satellite data. Uh, because they don't understand the strengths and limitations uh, like they should. So don't be scared to use the satellite data saying it's too hard. It's not too hard. You just have to be informed. Uh, and don't be afraid to ask for help. There are so many resources now, such as RSET, such as ACAST, such as web tools, um, uh, the review articles that I have. Um, so don't be afraid to find this information and read it and understand it. And above all, don't, don't be afraid to ask questions. I answer every question that I get. Uh, so just use these, in, these resources and uh, have fun playing with the data. Okay, so I'll let Paul on. To, uh, uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, this was very informative presentations. Uh, and we'll take question in a minute, but uh, just to, uh, rebrief everybody, this is week four, uh, and in this series we are not doing any assignments. So that's uh, slides. And the next week uh, will be a concluding session where we will talk about uh, future satellite capabilities for air quality monitoring. Uh, you have seen some of those missions uh, Brian talked in his talk today. Uh, we'll go a little bit more into detail of those missions and talk a few more new ones. Uh, we will talk about some of the geostationary uh, aerosols product which are currently available and some of them will be available in future. Uh, we'll also refresh uh, the course review and talk about some of the features, uh, in-person training workshops and webinar series uh, on the air quality and health topics. So uh, stay tuned for next week. Uh, we will have a lot more to cover next week. And with that, I think, uh, again, all the materials, including today's presentation, can be obtained from this website. Uh, this is our RSET website. And you can send me questions uh, to me or for today's presentation, you can also write directly to Brian. As he mentioned, he will be very happy to uh, answer any technical questions. Uh, with that, thank you very much. And we will take question answers. So you can uh, type in your question answers into the chat box. And Brian will uh, try to answer that. And I will help him if required. Thank you. So Brian, uh, the question will appear on the chat box here. Uh, you can just uh, take one at a time. Uh, it will be helpful if you can also read the questions. OK, I will. Wow. This first question sounds like it's for you, Pawan. It's about the different uh, level data uh, uh, OMI. Yes, so the question is what the difference between OMI level 2 and level 2G data. Okay, so, uh, so I'll take that first part first. So the level 2 and level 2G is basically, level 2 is the swath data, uh, which is, uh, which means the data is provided for every single pixel, which is 13 by 24 kilometer in case of OMI. Uh, level 2G is, uh, what they do is uh, they they combine the data within quarter degree by quarter degree latitude longitude box and provide the 
all the points within that quarter degree. So the idea of level 2G is to facilitate users to grid the data based on their criteria. So you we don't actually grid the data in advance or average the data for a quarter degree box, but it is left on the users to grid uh, so that they can decide on the quality flag, cloud masking, and other criteria they want to select. Uh, there is also uh, level three data which is gridded uh, in quarter degree. Uh, okay, so the next question is uh, OM arrow and OM arrow Z arrow source data. I am not familiar with OM arrow and OM arrow Z. I think you are talking about. So there are two arrow source product from OMI. Uh, one is from the NASA Goddard, which is OMAR RUV product. Uh, uh, and then, then there is the OM Arrow product, which is from KNMI uh, Netherlands. Uh, they use different uh, algorithms to produce the data. Uh, I believe the parameters uh, inside uh, those two product are similar. Uh, there are differences because they use different uh, uh, retrieval algorithm. And again, we can talk about that in more details in our advanced training or you can write to me, I can refer to your proper paper or documents uh, where you can read about those. Thank you. So Brian, take over, please. Okay, sulfur dioxide, if it's also detected by other instruments, so just the ozone monitoring instrument. It's uh, measured by several, uh, and it's also, uh, you may want to check out data from an instrument called the SUMI MPP, it's a NOAA NASA uh, endeavor, and they do have sulfur dioxide data. So you might want to check out the SUMI MPP, that's S U O M I MPP website, and you can find out more. There are also other SFT data sets from other instruments that have uh, since uh, gone away. Uh, so you may want to refer to these websites like the SUNY MPP to find out about the other data sets of, of path observation. Okay, is only data available free and globally? Yes, of course. All NASA data is free and publicly available to all. You don't have to pay for it. So you can go to the various NASA websites to allow, download all data yourself. Uh, the next question is, uh, how do we know the plume heights from satellites? For example, forest fire and agricultural burning. Some satellites give you information on the vertical distribution, such as from the instruments that use IR. Um, so the test instrument gives you vertical information. So you can look at data sets like that. Uh, also, there are some data sets, of, I believe like Calypso, uh, that give you information on aerosols on the vertical. And Paul may want to add, uh, add something to that. Okay, so in meteorology, we learned about high pressure areas and low pressure areas. Does it affect uh, the NOx and SO2 uh, column? Uh, yes, certainly. So if you're going to estimate the emissions, for example, from a, a power plant using nitrogen dioxide or sulfur dioxide data, you have to be very aware of how fast the wind is blowing, for instance. So if it's a very windy day, the plume will be uh, stretched out. It will be, the, the pollution will be uh, transported over a much larger area. So you have to account for this to actually estimate uh, emissions from a specific source. So yes, definitely. Uh, OCO2 and GOSET show a lot of differences. Why? Well, one of them, uh, the OCO2 data I showed was CO2, carbon dioxide. And the GOSAT data with another trace gas called methane. So that's why they're different. They have different sources. Um, is there any VOC reactivity product available uh, for users of the only data? Not that I'm aware of. This is actually a really good question because if you look at the VOC reactivity in the southeastern US, for instance, it's dominated by isoprene coming naturally from the trees. But if you go to a place like India or China, uh, it's going to be more dominated by anthropogenic or man-made emissions. So it is important to understand 
the VOC reactivity. So I do know of a few people that are starting to look into this issue, but as of yet, we don't have that data set. Um, there are some older papers from the 1990s that do discuss VOC reactivity, but uh, just from very local conditions like in one city. So we have a question about the microwave limb sounder aura data. Uh, this instrument I didn't talk about because it's more important for the stratospheric and upper tropospheric research. Uh, and honestly, I don't know how to answer this question. What is the difference in taking water vapor and OH data for calculating stratospheric water vapor concentration? Um, I don't know, but if you write me directly, I will be able to uh, ask a stratospheric person how to answer to your question. Okay, what is the difficulty of measuring CO2 from satellites? Uh, the OCO2 data is currently being analyzed, and it, it's, uh, only, there's only a few years of the data, and there's a number of people working on converting the electromagnetic radiation measured by the instrument into a CO2 concentration or column. One of the problems with carbon dioxide is actually measuring, for instance, um, surface pressure. That's required to create the column data. Uh, and that, surprisingly, is a very difficult thing to measure. And if you don't get it right, you won't get your carbon dioxide. So you need surface pressure. Uh, another problem with carbon dioxide uh, for, um, for instance, at looking at emissions from cities or power plants is that carbon dioxide is so long-lived that it has a huge background. So it's being transported around the atmosphere. And so signals from cities and power plants are actually very small to the amount that's already in the atmosphere. So they have to be very accurate. So the instrument has to be incredibly accurate to measure these small little changes uh, in carbon dioxide seen above power plants, for instance. So it's very difficult. So stay tuned for the OCO2 data. Um, there are a few papers coming out, uh, but they still have a little work to do. So, so give them a little time and you can always check the OCO2 website. So atmospheric correction, I'm not sure what that means, but I think this is the, um, in the retrieval algorithm, converting the electromagnetic radiation to a quantity requires knowledge of the atmosphere, what's going on in the atmosphere. So are there aerosols there? Where are the clouds? You have to understand this because, for instance, if you look, uh, if you're in an airplane and you look down at clouds, they look very bright because they're scattering uh, the sun's light back at you. So all of these uh, things require uh, uh, quite a bit of information, uh, but I'm not specifically knowledgeable about this term atmospheric correction, so maybe I didn't define it quite right. Okay, which of these gases measured have so far shown to be more co-related or with morbidity and mortality? Uh, particulate matter, definitely particulate matter. Uh, over most of the world, especially in places like India and China, it's very highly correlated, even here in the US and, and in Europe. Uh, ozone is another problem that uh, pollutant that's well correlated with morbidity and mortality. And as I said before, nitrogen dioxide is a, a third uh, air pollutant that while it's not that unhealthy at the levels that we have in the atmosphere, um, it's usually co-located with the release of other air toxics. So it is also has a correlation with morbidity and mortality. Okay, why is a column measurement in micrograms per centimeter squared instead of a volumetric unit? unit? Uh, the units are actually molecules per centimeter squared. And that's because the satellite detects all of the molecules of a specific gas between the instrument and space and the Earth's surface. Uh, and, it's, and we don't really get that much information on the vertical distribution. Sometimes there's a little information, but not much. Uh, so it's very difficult to convert uh, these columns to a volumetric unit, like a nose level concentration, unless you use an atmospheric model. Uh, and that way you can then estimate or infer what the nose level concentration is. So there are people working on that now. Uh, so you may want to check the literature in the next few years to find out what people have done. Uh, 
Um, I'll skip the MLS ORAC question again. I don't know that. Uh, sulfur dioxide is detected by uh, Josumian PP instrument, uh, and there are several others out there. You can go to the web uh, resources uh, in the paper that I talked about, Table 2 in my review article, and you can find out what the other instruments are. And Brock has answered that question. Okay. So I know that several groups have created biogenic VOC emissions for specific regions derived from satellite from all high data. Are you aware of any effort to create a publicly available global isoprene emission data set? Uh, no, but I do know of several groups in the US and Europe who are doing just that. Uh, one is uh, Dylan Malay, M-I-L-L-E-T. He's at the University of Minnesota. So you may want to look at his website uh, for that. Uh, other groups that have done interesting work on formaldehyde uh, from isoprene have come out of Daniel Jacobs' group at Harvard University. It's J-A-T-O-B, Daniel Jacobs. So go to their websites and you'll be able to find out more information about formaldehyde. And I believe that's all the questions. No, there aren't. One more. Um, are any aerosol products available in GIS formats for spatial analysis, web map mapping, and GIS processing capabilities? I will allow or ask the Pawan to answer this question because I'm not familiar uh, with the aerosol products like I am the trace gases. Uh, yes. Uh, so, the new GIS software like ArcGIS R does handle uh, HDF data format. Uh, so that's one thing you can do. Uh, also, there are ways, uh, for example, all the level three aerosols data can be obtained through the Giovanni in GeoTIFF format, uh, which can be uh, used inside the GIS uh, software. Uh, there are other tools uh, being developed uh, which will be able to convert the HDF file into GeoTIFF file uh, to get the aerosols data into GIS format. Thank you. Okay, from where can we get the gridded high resolution CO2 data over the south southeast Asia? Again, I, I don't know exactly right now, but I would go to the OCO-2 website. Uh, it is on the, it's easily found on the internet, and you will be able to find out about their data availability there. So this is the OCO, uh, I believe it's the Orbini Carbon Observatory-2 instrument. There is a specific question about the GIS software, and I'm not sure what the answer to that is. Maybe Paul on can answer. Yes, uh, the new GIS softwares like ArcView Arc can read the HDF file. How can we get the gridded high resolution isoprene data over the Southeast Asia? Um, it's very difficult. We can't measure isoprene through space, uh, though there are estimates from computer model out there. Uh, one of them is called MEGAN, M-E-G-A-N. 
uh, and that will give you information on uh, isoprene uh, estimated emissions. And also the person I mentioned before, like Dylan Millay, uh, he can take formaldehyde data from satellites and infer the isoprene emissions data. So you can check those two sources out. The reference for the maps over Atlanta, you can just say courtesy of Locke Lonsol. That is the person who made them. And I'll type right now into the box his name. L-O-K-L-A-N-S-A-L. So you can just say courtesy of Locke Lonsol. He's here at NASA. Okay, it looks like we don't have any more questions. So thank you all for listening. Thank you, bro. Uh, thank you, Brian, very much. Uh, and uh, I think it was very useful and great talk. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for attending this. And uh, we will see you next week uh, with the final presentation. So please stay tuned. There's a lot of exciting things. And we'll also talk about some of the future air quality opp training opportunities in the next week talk. Thank you.